6.1 practice problems. For our classroom demonstration, a chemistry teacher put samples of two different pure solid powders in a beaker. The teacher places a beaker in a small, on a small wooden board with a wet surface, then stirs the contents of the beaker. After a short time, the students observe the bottom of the beaker is frozen to the wood surface. The teacher asks the students to make a claim about the observation to justify their claims. Uh, which of the following is the best claim and justification based off of the student's observation? Now, um, we see um, something freezing, which means that energy was taken out of that. It was absorbed into something else. So that means uh, that we are going to be endothermic. So I am going to eliminate all um, options that are not endothermic. And then... Um, we are uh, going to read these two and see which one is better. So C says an endothermic physical change occurred because the freezing of water is an endothermic process. Okay, um, the freezing of water is an exothermic process, one. And two, this is not just a physical uh, change. Uh, temperature change is an indicator of um, a reaction taking place. So C does not make any sense. And then D says, an endothermic chemical change occurred because the temperature of the beaker and the water on the board decreased as heat was absorbed by the reaction. Um, again, um, we were taking energy in from the surrounding systems and decreasing the system, uh, the surrounding system's energy to increase the uh, system energy of the reaction. So that is an endothermic process. So that matches. Which of the following phase change involves the transfer of heat from the surroundings to the system? So from the surroundings to the system mean that I am going to be increasing my overall energy state within the phase change. So I am going to be going from a lower energy state to a higher energy state. Um, as we remember, solid is going to be uh, less energy than liquid which is less energy than gas. So I'm looking for something that goes either from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas or solid to gas. Okay, gas to liquid, um, we are decreasing the energy, so no. Gas to solid, uh, very much decreasing the energy, so no. Liquid to solid, wrong direction, no. And finally, D, um, where we have liquid to gas, uh, that is going to be correct because uh, liquid is a lower energy state than that of gas. So I would have needed to absorb energy from the surroundings in order to uh, undergo that phase change. In the spring, blossoms on cherry trees can be damaged when temperatures fall below two, uh, negative two degrees Celsius. When the forecast calls for air temperatures to be below negative five degrees Celsius for a few hours one night, a farmer sprays his blossoming cherry trees with water, claiming that the blossoms will be protected by the water as it freezes. Which of the following is a correct scientific justification for spraying water on the blossoms to protect them from temperatures below negative two degrees Celsius? Water on the blossoms will not freeze unless the air temperature falls significantly below negative five degrees Celsius. So the freezing temperature of water is zero degrees Celsius. So that is uh, not going to be the case. Water is a good thermal conductor that transfers heat from cold air to the blossoms, keeping the blossoms from going below negative two. Um, if it was a good thermal conductor, that means that it is going to transfer the heat uh, very well and very efficiently, which means that the blossoms would feel colder than just the air. So that does not make any sense. The freezing water is an endothermic process. Thus, water that freezes on the blossoms absorb heat from the atmosphere, which in turn keeps the blossoms above zero degrees Celsius. Uh, so freezing is an exothermic process. We have to release energy to go from a higher energy state of liquid to a lower energy state of solid. So C is going to be eliminated. D says the freezing of water is an exothermic process. Thus, water that freezes on the blossoms reaches 
uh, releases heat to keep the blossoms at or above negative two degrees Celsius. That is the only one that could possibly explain the phenomenon uh, correctly. The elements potassium and chlorine react directly to form the compound potassium chloride according to the equation above. Refer to the information above and the table below to answer the question that follows. Um, which values for uh, delta H uh, is, uh, for a process in the table is or are less than zero indicated, uh, which indicates an exothermic process? So um, we are going to uh, release energy and we're looking for some examples of something where we are releasing energy as we do so. So uh, going from solid to gas, uh, that requires an intake of energy because the uh, gaseous particles have more energy, so no. Um, definitely not V. Here we have um, the uh, gaseous potassium releasing an electron and becoming its own ion, uh, you are going to uh, have to put in some energy in order to steal that electron, so no. Uh, chlorine here, where uh, we are going from a, a pretty solid, stable, bonded uh, diatomic chlorine to two chlorines separate, no longer stably bonded, you would have to put in energy in order to get them to separate, so no. Here um, we have a chlorine accepting an electron going to a uh, ion state where we have uh, uh, met the electron configuration of that of a noble gas and therefore are in a uh, more stable state. This is uh, what chlorine likes to do, so yes. And then we have the ions of potassium and chlorine uh, being uh, going into a reaction together and uh, forming potassium chloride. That is um, also going to be um, a state that is uh, lower energy and so therefore would release energy into the system. So Y and Z are the only system states that uh, match that exothermic process. Uh, the dissolution of an ionic solute in a polar solvent can be imagined as occurring in three steps, as shown in the figure above. In step one, the separation between ions in the solute is greatly increased, uh, just as will occur when the solute dissolves in a polar solvent. In step two, the uh, Polar solvent is expanded to make spaces that the ions will occupy. In the last step, the ions are inserted into the spaces in the polar solvent. In uh, which of the following best describes the enthalpy, enthalpy change, or delta H, for each step? So taking the uh, ions that are attracted to each other and getting them farther away from each other is going to require energy. So that is going to be an endothermic process. Uh, taking these water molecules, which um, are generally attracted to each other, and then forcing them farther apart so that you have more room is also going to be an endothermic process. And then here, where we have the water kind of collapsing around those individual ions, and we have uh, the polar portions of the water being attracted to those individual ions. Uh, this is going to be a decrease of energy state. We are going uh, into a more relaxed state, more uh, normal. So this is going to be an exothermic process. So that means that we are looking for endo, endo, exo as our um, uh, types. And that is going to be option choice D. Which of the following best helps to explain why the value for delta H for dissolving of calcium fluoride in water is positive? Uh, so it being positive means that I had to put in 
energy in order to get calcium fluoride to dissolve. Uh, so that means that the uh, calcium and fluoride did not really want to separate. So I am going to say that the calcium and the fluorine were very attracted to each other. Uh, insoluble, we wouldn't be able to make this happen at all. Um, calcium fluoride is ionic. Uh, forming calcium fluoride particles when it dissolves is not how calcium fluoride uh, would form. It would form a calcium ion and a fluoride ion. Uh, calcium ions have a very strong ion-ion interaction with a fluorine ion in their crystal lattice. They are very attracted to each other. We have that Coulomb's law going on where we have a very strong charge from calcium of positive two and we have um, our fluorine being very, very small, which means that we can get it very, very close to that calcium, and so we have a very short distance as well. Uh, this makes sense. Uh, option choice D says ion dipole interaction. Uh, calcium and fluorine are ion ion. They are not ion dipole. This is not a uh, temporary charge situation. This is a permanent charge, so that would be ion ion, not ion dipole.